Welcome to Public Health On Call, a new podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Our focus is the novel coronavirus. I'm Josh Sharfstein, a faculty member at Johns Hopkins and also a former secretary of Maryland's Health Department. Our goal with this podcast is to bring evidence and experts to help you understand today's news about the novel coronavirus and what it means for tomorrow. If you have questions, you can email them to publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. Today, I'm talking to Dr. Jennifer Nuzzo, Senior Scholar at the Center for Health Security at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. We're answering questions that have been coming in all week about the novel coronavirus. Let's listen. Dr. Nazo, thanks so much for joining me. Today's a Friday, so we'll be answering listener questions. Are you ready? I'm ready. So the first question has to do with the protests over the killing of George Floyd. What can people do to reduce the risk of contracting coronavirus during one of the protests? To reduce your risk, you follow the same practices that we recommend anytime you're out in public. Try to keep physical distance from people. Stand at least six feet away if you can. Certainly wash your hands as much as possible, particularly after you touch common surfaces. There's no soap available. Um, Having hand sanitizer on hand could be uh, quite useful. So something probably important to bring with you. And then finally, in this setting, um, many people are wearing a mask and that's a good idea. That may help uh, reduce the chances that if you're infected, that you'll spread your uh, the virus onto others. Great. I've heard that at some protests, they're passing out masks and hand sanitizer. That's a great idea. Next question. Do higher risk patients ever have mild coronavirus or is it always the case that people who are higher risk get very sick? They do. I mean, um, Certainly, people of advanced age and people with underlying conditions statistically are among those uh, who are most likely to be hospitalized and die, but that's not always the case. People in both those categories um, also may have mild infection or may become sick and um, survive their illness. I just heard a story about a 104-year-old woman who beat COVID-19, and apparently first thing she wanted was a cold beer. When is it okay to resume routine medical and dental care? So this is something that's already happening in in many communities. I think we're realizing that there is a strong need to maintain basic health services and all the preventative care that keeps us healthy. So um, what you'll probably see, particularly in dental settings, is uh, they'll be using different kinds of personal protective equipment than they um, additionally use. I've heard some dentists may um, charge uh, their customers for the added cost of this, but um, it is very important for people to... um, continue to maintain their bodies and engage in the preventative care. And so I think increasingly you'll see these services available. It's reasonable for people to call and ask what kinds of precautions those offices are taking. Absolutely. So a couple of questions about vaccines. One is, will people who've already been infected with COVID-19 be eligible for a vaccine when it comes out? We don't know yet. Um, it's partially going to be determined by the science that we're still doing and trying to understand um, what equates to an immune response and protection. Um, And so uh, that will be determined once we figure out uh, what vaccine is the one that's going to be used. The question is, given the urgency of getting a vaccine, are are you concerned about people cutting corners for safety? We should not cut corners for safety. I think there are some steps that can be taken to expedite the research and development process. Um, That's what we're doing right now in order to get a vaccine. Things like potentially paying for later uh, phases of research, paying for that and planning for that in advance. um, That is potentially involves a uh, financial risk, but not a public health risk. Um, But it's really important that the science be allowed to proceed as it needs to so that we can be absolutely sure that the vaccine that we pick at the end is both effective and safe. Great. That makes sense. Are gloves necessary or recommended like masks? So outside of a healthcare environment, um, I don't believe that gloves should be worn. Um, The most important thing you can do to prevent, you know, contamination is to wash your hands when you touch surfaces. There's a worry that if you wear gloves, you may think that you're protected and Those gloves can be contaminated and you can still touch your eyes, mouth, and nose uh, while you're wearing them. Really, you would use a glove in certain settings like medical settings because you're trying to um, prevent yourself from from giving something to the patient or if the patient has uh, some infection that you're trying to protect yourself from, but it's not needed um, out and about living everyday life. 
Great. If people are asymptomatic, what is their method of transmission? If they're not coughing or sneezing, then how does the virus get from one person to another? Right. So that's a really great question. And we're still trying to understand how um, asymptomatic transmission happens and the extent to which it happens. Clearly, there needs to be some way for the virus to get out. A few ways that we think that the virus might be getting out is if people are talking to each other, you know, in relatively um, short distances, it's possible for someone who's infected and doesn't yet have symptoms to put some virus out there that someone who's standing close by could be exposed to. We also know that in other environments like singing, for instance, there have been some outbreaks you know, that occurred in, in settings where people are singing. And um, the more you can sort of force air out of your mouth, the uh, I guess the greater the possibility of uh, it would carry virus with it. There's also been some transmission that have occurred in very close quarters. So between husbands and wives or roommates, and we don't know exactly how that transmission occurred, but you can imagine a number of ways where maybe people are you know, touching their mouths and then touching surfaces or something along those lines. But anyway, it's, I think there's a lot of work still that needs to be done to understand exactly the extent to which asymptomatic transmission happens and how exactly it does. Great. Could COVID-19 or a variant have been here before January 2020? So we don't know uh, yet, still, when the virus first came to the United States. Um, we don't have any evidence yet that it was here in December, but we also don't have evidence that it wasn't here. There has, I think, been one case in France that may have um, occurred uh, in December, but that's really the only evidence so far that the virus may have been outside of China prior to January. Got it. Thank you. One last question. Why is the coronavirus striking the U.S. so much harder than any other country? And the questioner says, can't be because of tourism, because other countries have received tourists too. So I believe that the reason why we have so many cases in the U.S. is that we were relatively slow to respond to the cases when they first occurred. So we lost a few months of time. We weren't able to test for the virus. And so that really, I believe, allowed the virus to spread within the U.S. undetected. And because we didn't know that the virus was here and who was infected, that meant that we weren't taking actions to try to stop the spread. Like basically, people were found to be infected, um, identifying and um, monitoring the contacts of, of people who also may have been exposed. Um, and so that just meant that the virus gained a foothold in the U.S. And now we're basically playing catch up, trying to um, put the virus back in the box, trying to find everybody who's infected and trace their contacts and do all the things. But what we've seen from other countries is those who did respond quite early um, and were able to test and identify infected people upon arrival, um, then they uh, prevented the case numbers from, from growing too large. Got it. Well, thanks so much for taking time, Dr. Nazo, uh, today to answer these questions. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you for listening to Public Health on Call, a new podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Please send questions to be covered in future podcasts to publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. This podcast is produced by Josh Sharfstein, Lindsay Smith-Rogers, and Lamare Morales. Audio production by Niall Owen McCusker and Spencer Greer, with support from Chip Hickey. Distribution by Nick Moran. Thank you for listening.